Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is a uh, privilege to be here and to be before you this morning. As our uh, children are dismissed and young people are dismissed, we want to pray for them. Amen. That the Lord will uh, truly move in their heart, their mind, and in our lives. Amen. Amen. This morning we're going to be coming out of the book of Matthew. We're going to continue on in Matthew, Matthew chapter 12. Uh, Pastor Anderson preached um, previously from Matthew 12, 1 through uh, 11, and, and we're going to pick up, um, I'm sorry, 15, verse 15 to 37. Uh, he preached from uh, Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 14, and we're going to pick up in the next passage. Matthew chapter 12, verses 15 through 37. And um, a title for today's uh, word, a theme, when your good deeds are trampled by bad seeds. Uh -oh. Amen, amen. amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace and your goodness and your love. Father God, we need you this morning. Father, I pray that you would bless, Lord, this, uh, this time of preaching. Lord, that it would honor you, Lord, everything that is said, everything that is communicated, Father God, that you and you alone will receive glory. Father, I pray that you would use me, Lord, as a vessel for your honor. Father God, fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord God, take control, Lord. I pray that even, Lord, that you would um, help us as a congregation to be hearers of your word, be hearers and doers of your word, and not just hearers. Lord, we need you, Father God. Help us, God. Help me, Lord God. We we ask your blessing on this time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 In our uh, passage uh, today, we are going to see two kingdoms, two kingdoms in battle. One is dangerous and evil, and one kingdom is set, and this kingdom is set up to take glory away from God. And the other kingdom is eternal righteous, is an eternal and righteous kingdom. Believe it or not, the kingdoms that we talk about in our past today, they are present today, waging war. Waging war. You have Jesus and God's people, one kingdom, and you have Satan, his demons, and those who reject Jesus and the other kingdom, waging war. Part of how Jesus wages his war and his kingdom is by changing people's lives on the spot. He provides these kingdom results in a fallen world. See, in our passage today, Jesus had just dealt with the Pharisees regarding the importance and purpose of the Sabbath. And to a greater degree, the importance of restoring things that the fall interrupted. He, so he heals on the Sabbath. The man in the shriveled hand, shriveled hand, he restores his hand and its use, and he gives the man a new lease on life. And as we come to our passage, that has just happened in public. And, and the Pharisees, it says in verse number 14, but the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Verse number 15, I want to read 15 on down to 21. For today, and, 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 and in this particular passage, the point is the king and his kingdom bring good news. They, he brings good things and good news. Verse 15, aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. Many followed him, and he healed all their sick, warning them not to tell who he was. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love and whom I I delight, I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he leads justice to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. Here we see this particular passage that Matthew references from Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 4, this is a messianic passage. It's a passage in the Old Testament that looks forward to the Messiah, Jesus. And this passage points to certain things that the Messiah will eventually do in our world. He will bring justice. 
and he will create a just world. And praise God for that. And as we look at this particular passage from Isaiah 42, we see some things about Jesus. And we see some things about the kingdom. I just want to kind of highlight, and we talk as we talk about the king and his kingdom bringing good things. Number one, in verse number 18, it talks about, here's my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love and whom I delight. He is chosen and loved. Jesus is this loved uh, 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 a person. He, he is loved by the Father, and he has, he has dropped down in our lives. He is the only plan of redemption for a world spiraling out of control. He is chosen in love. We are presented with the best plan for our salvation. There is no other way. There is no other name given to men by which we must be saved. There is no other option. There is no plan B. In fact, your options outside of Jesus are ineffective and insufficient. Jesus is the one. He is chosen in love. It says, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He is chosen in love, verse 18. Verse 18b, it says that he is empowered by the Spirit to proclaim justice to the world. That this Jesus that we proclaim that, that has just healed this man that has been doing things and preaching and, and multiplying food and, and, and visiting the oppressed and the sick, that this Jesus is empowered to proclaim justice to the world. In his humanity, we are saying that Jesus was empowered by the Spirit to be a justice warrior. He would go places that no one would go in order to establish justice, in order to establish love and fairness within society because that's what was missing. His ministry would not just be local, but it would be global. You realize this, that Jesus is about the work of justice even today. Yeah. He is looking at the plight of the oppressed. He is looking at the plight of those who have been silenced. Yeah. And Jesus yeah. is, is taking up their cause in the act of justice. Yeah. His ministry is global to the nations, not just a neighborhood thing, but a global thing. When we talk about justice, it is the process or event of judgment, the resulting state, a righteous judgment that Jesus looks at the wrong that is happening in our world, and when he sees it, he knows just what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. Amen. Our God is a just God. That this Jesus that we talk about, that we sing about, that we pray to, is very interested in the, what's going on in our neighborhoods and in our lives. Jesus is about that restorative act. Yeah. All of it is anchored in Jesus because what? He is a righteous king over a righteous kingdom. Verse number 19 through 21. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he leads justice to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. He is unbreakable in his purpose, and he remains victorious. Jesus is unbreakable, and that's what the writer is talking about, that, that he is no soft soul on the street. That when G, we talk about Jesus, oftentimes when we look at Jesus as he's portrayed in paintings and in books, he looks real soft in Hollywood. But I want you to know that the Jesus of the Bible is not soft and he's not Hollywood. He is strong and he is, he is advocating. He's saying, look, a little, a little resistance will not deter me from my goal and my purpose and victory. See, when Jesus arrives on the scene and he is invited in, the kingdom is invited in, there is transformation. See, the gospel of the kingdom of God makes possible restoration, repair relationships, neighborhoods, and larger society. That's his purpose. He says this justice will go and be proclaimed to the nations. As we think about this, as we enter Black History Month, we understand as black folks, there is a great challenge to find justice and to see it expressed and to see it happen, to see it come alive and expressed in our communities, in this nation. We see so much injustice. 
Oftentimes we look to other circles and other people to, to, to talk about justice, the academics and the pundits. But I would suggest to you that, that God himself, Jesus owns the subject of justice. He owns what justice will look like. You don't need to go any further than your Bible to see what justice looks like. And black people, folk, we need that. It seems that something has awoken or awakened, I don't know the proper English, <laughs> but something has awakened the races in our country. They've come out the woodwork like cockroaches. And they go on TV and they talk of their stuff and, and they say all manner of evil. We have to hold on to Jesus. Yes, we do. Yes, we, we've got to hold. We've got to yes. reference Jesus when it comes to what we see and what we hear. And it may seem bleak. It may seem like there is overwhelming. Yes. We think about what they are doing. They're, they're silencing the history. They're silencing the voice. And they're, 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 they love when we can, they can silence those who are oppressed. But I want you to know that Jesus takes up the cause of the oppressed, yes. of the silence. Yes. That's what he does. Not only that, we see that this Jesus, he is chosen and loved and, and, and he is unbreakable in his purpose and that he sees and that, that he is proclaiming justice in the streets throughout as the, as the writer of Isaiah proclaims in his messianic psalm, a messianic uh, message from Isaiah 42. Not only that, but we go on down, we see this justice uh, it, it exemplified in the next few verses. Look at verse number 22 to 32. I just want to read real quickly, and we'll dive in. 22, it says, Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of God, so Jesus, what does he do? He, he, he has this public demonstration of, of, of what he brings to a dying world. This is that good thing that we're talking about, that here was this demon-possessed man. He was enslaved in, in his life. He had no voice. He could not see. He was an oppressed man. And Jesus steps in and releases him from the power and the bondage of sinfulness. He performs his miracle. And they say, in verse 22b, could this be the son of David? Here you see a manifestation of the kingdom of God on in action in front of these individuals, these people. God does this amazing thing by releasing this man from his state, from his condition. Man, but I'm going to tell you what. We talked in the beginning about there being two kingdoms. There's God's kingdom, but there is also the world's kingdom. And the world's kingdom is set up to destroy and distract Verse 24, but when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can rob his house. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every sin and bad blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. That's some hard words, y'all. That's some hard words. But question to you as we dive into this, have you ever met a hater? You know, somebody that, um, that simply lives, eats, and drinks hate. You're with them. There's nothing that you or anyone else that is, that is doing is a good thing. They, create the, they critique the best of things. These folks don't like ice cream, puppies, or cotton candy. They wake up bitter. They go to bed bitter. I remember watching a movie called Precious. 
Remember pressure, hold on, you Man, I, I remember watching this movie, and, and, and when I think about it, hey, I think about Monique, her role in that movie. She was a mom in that movie. She just was just nasty. She was everything. That precious did was just, was just wasn't good. That's these Pharisees. They look at something good that this man was released from bondage to demonic possession, and they say that, Jesus, you're not doing that by the power of God. Instead, you are doing that by Beelzebub, which was the name of the prince of demons. And, and you drive, you actually use demonic energy to drive out demons. He said, that's, they said, that's what you're doing right then and there. Beelzebub was a, was a pagan Philistine god worshipped in the ancient, ancient Philistine, Philistine. And, and, and the, the, the idea behind this, this Beelzebub was this god, this, this image, this, this idol that was in the shape of an insect, a fly. And it signified the god of filth. Filth. And so it's like a, as a fly kind of buzzes around, you know, stuff, uh, they said uh, this demon that Jesus used, the god of filth, to cast out this demon so that this man could be made whole. He was despicable deity, and they put this on Jesus. They were the haters of all haters. And Jesus, I love this, that Jesus undresses them. Jesus addresses their very condition. He says, look, in verse number 25, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. He gives these principles of the kingdom of God. These are really important that we, we kind of grab a hold of when we think about the kingdom of God. I'm going to talk just briefly about the characteristics of the kingdom of God. God's kingdom has a united direction. God's kingdom is without question a righteous kingdom. It is about the rule and reign of Christ on the earth, in our lives, in a context. The suggestion that Jesus is using the power of the world's kingdom in order to fulfill God's agenda is an insult because it disrupts the whole idea of a united force. The devil would not side with God's agenda. We must be able to, as believers, be able to distinguish between God's kingdom and what it looks like and Satan's kingdom and what it looks like. If we don't have that kind of discernment, we are in trouble. We can be deceived. We can be led astray. But here these Pharisees, have, have, they have dropped so low that they want to suggest that Jesus is doing the work that he's doing by the power of the God of filth. They said, Jesus, you're running a pyramid scheme led by a Nigerian prince. <laughs> but Jesus says if Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How can this kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, whom do your people drive them out? He says, look, what are you all using? Verse 28 on down, another characteristic of the kingdom is that it has unmatched strength. That when you talk about God's kingdom, we're not just talking about, we're talking about a, 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 an immovable, powerful force in the earth. That the God's kingdom cannot be thwarted. It cannot be stopped. He says, verse 20, but if by the spirit of God I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man and then plunder the house? Jesus gives this whole idea, this metaphor of, of if you go into a, a, a house, you must first take away all defensives in order to plunder that house. And Jesus driving out the demons, showing that he is stronger than any demonic force. Jesus goes into the strong man's house, and he is plundering the kingdom of this world. Jesus. Not this soft Jesus, but Jesus who is the strong man of the earth comes from heaven to earth, comes into the kingdom of this world, and goes about releasing people from bondage and slavery that have been kept and bound all of their lives. Jesus and his kingdom loosens shackles, breaks bondages. He breaks the yoke. Yes, yes, amen. 
Jesus comes into your filth and bondage and restores your house. Amen. Amen. You know that Jesus and the kingdom of God comes in order to release, in order to, to, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Jubilee, you are liberated from all that binds you. This is the kingdom of God. See, this is good news. When you think about what good news is, good news because we all need someone who's willing to come into our filth, to come into our bodies and release us from what the enemy has kept us bound with for years. You need somebody stronger than your flesh. You need somebody stronger than the devil. You need somebody stronger than the world. And, and not to be insulted, but Oprah ain't going to do it for you. <laughs> Ayanna Von Zach, ain't going to do it for you. You can stick your head in the ground all you want. Jesus is the one. Amen. Jesus is the one. I'm, I'm telling you, those things that we carry around, it's like Jesus... Come, and him coming from heaven to earth into our context, it's like Jesus goes, it's like, you know, in the sports world, when a team goes on the road and they, they go into another sports arena, another complex, and they win a game. It's a road win. Those road wins are tougher than the games at home. See, Jesus is going, when you look at the Gospels, what is he doing? He's going on road wins. These are all wins that he's making, he's accomplishing. He's going into those places that, that, that we are scared to go, that we don't know, that, that, that we, you know, the Pharisees, they plastered over evil. They knew how to hide evil. Jesus doesn't hide from evil. He goes into the very places of evil, the very existence, the very depths of our heart where sin exists, and he wants to expose it, and he does that on the cross. And he conquers sin and death on the cross. Third characteristics about the kingdom of God. Look at verse number 30 to 32. He says, and he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the son of man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. Whoever is not with me is against me. And Jesus addresses this. He says to them, the, the, the only, and it's very important, the only unpardonable sin, the only sin that cannot be forgiven is what happens in this particular biblical context when these Pharisees assign the power of God and the Holy Spirit to the prince of demons. Because they did that, Jesus says, there is no way that you can be redeemed. He said, you can say all manner of evil against me, and you can come and be forgiven. But what you're not going to do is say what you said about God the Holy Spirit. To attribute the works of God the Holy Spirit that he healed this man and released them from bondage. And you got the audacity to say that I did this through bells above. Jesus just basically opens wreck shops on them, and they don't even realize what he has just proclaimed to them. But that is the only sin that God does, did not forgive, and it's, it's within this particular context here. And, and, and I think that that's important, that, that Jesus was serious. These are some serious words, and, you know, we, we talk about uncompromised allegiance that Jesus desires, and he draws a line in the sand. He does that throughout the scriptures. He draws his line in the sand, and sometimes we soften that. Amen. Jesus says, look, if you're not with me, you're actually against me. Did you hear that? Amen. There's no soft middle. There ain't no soft middle. There's with me or against me. You're either working for me or you're working against me. So when we talk about disciples are called disciples because they have chosen to follow Jesus. That's, that's why they're called disciples because they've chosen to follow Jesus. If you're a disciple of Jesus, you are a follower of Jesus. See, Jesus resisted lukewarm believers 
Folks that want to compromise, they want to live in compromise. They love the soft middle. Well, I, today is this, I'm not really feeling, I'm trying to live my own thing today and, and I'll come back. No, Jesus is like, look, you're either with me, you're either working for me or you're scattering. And lukewarm believers, they compromised whenever it was possible. This was a flaky crowd. You ever been around flaky people? <laughs> You talk to them one day, like, hey, that's my opinion today. You talk to them the next day, and they, uh, uh, they do that a lot. Uh, uh, <laughs> but they're here today, and they're gone tomorrow. But here's the reality is that Jesus proclaims, this is, look, this is, this is life. These are life and death issues. And the eternal consequences for assigning the works of God to Satan, these religious groups, Religious leaders were irredeemable, but but I want us to really grab a hold of, of verse 30. He who is not with me is against me, and, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Man, have you participated in scattering this week? You know, we can participate in that work of scattering by how we live. And we say that we're followers of Jesus. We say that we represent Jesus, but we are about the work of scattering because of the things we say, the places we go, the, the stuff we do. And so the question becomes, when it comes to the, the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God, whose side are you on? Mm -hmm. Whose side are we on? Yeah. Who directs your life? Who rules and reigns in your life? Is it your agenda or is it God's agenda? Yeah. And so that question, choose you this day whom you will serve. Yeah. Yeah. That's before us. That's the real. We're talking about the kingdom of God. So Jesus goes about calling and preaching the kingdom of God come. You know, he's calling those who are on the, the fringes, the margins of society. He's gathering them to himself. He's encouraging them, come, come, come. But I want you to know when you come, this is what it means. See, Jesus is looking to do some powerful things in our lives and in our world, but he requires uncompromised allegiance. Sounds hard. I don't know. It's, it's rough. It's rough. But he said it. I didn't. He said it. Because we have reshaped what discipleship looks like. We have reshaped what, what following Jesus looks like. We've shaped discipleship to look like just coming to church, coming to small group, and, and these little trinkets that we like to give God. But God is asking for complete allegiance. And I'm going to tell you what, just Paul, if God is speaking to you right now, wherever you're at, and you're struggling with this compromise thing. Today is that day. Today is that day. Make the choice. Make the choice. Man, the kingdoms of this world will only yield sorrow. You see that in verse 33 to 37. Let's read. Make a tree. Jesus goes on, talks about, he gives this other metaphor. Uh, about fruit inspection, make a, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers. How can you who are evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of your heart, the mouth speaks. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. <laughs> but the whole idea, Jesus, I mean, he lays this out, and this is, this is throughout scripture, that that the fruit of a tree, that, that we are fruit inspectors in, in one sense, that, that we can't determine who someone is, but we can look at the actions of a person. We can look at the things that they say to see if there is good fruit or there is bad fruit, that there is evil, there is good. And so we, we observe, right? We observe those things that the, the Pharisees were speaking. And what he tells them is that you are a broad of Bible. Jesus is name calling y'all. That the, that the one that the that the only thing that you do is spew poison day in and day out, and we gotta recognize when we come across folks like this, we recognize it for what it is. 
That's a precursor to judgment. And he looks and he sees that, that and he says, look, the metaphor is of a tree that, that, that a, a, a tree that's good will bring good fruit. That something connected, that something that is living will bring forth good fruit. Something that is dead is bringing bad fruit. The nature of the kingdom of this world is that it is evil. It is evil. And we don't often, we're, we're very reluctant to talk about that. That the fruit that we see on television on social media, yeah. personal conversation, the fruit that we see in our school, all this fruit, we've got to be able to judge these good things versus these bad things. The one thing that you should be as a Christian is discerning. Amen. To be able to discern between good and evil. Guess how you get discerning? Read the life of Jesus. And if you're in this, if you're in this, you can discern good fruit from bad fruit. You can discern evil from good. If you're praying, you can discern. If you're around the beat, you can discern good from bad. These religious leaders who had just committed the unpardonable sin, they are, they are in the face of irrefutable evidence that the kingdom of God was there. They spoke evil. And God says, there is judgment coming your way. The next stop for this world, kingdom, because they've committed blasphemy, which is slander, would be judgment. They have to give an account for their slander, their lying, the cussing, and the fussing. <laughs> Jesus goes down to this passage and talks about, man, that, that the fruit of what comes out of a good tree, it will produce good things that will nourish all those around. But did I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. I don't even need to preach this stuff. It's, it's right there. But it's a warning to be careful about the things that we say and, 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 that, and that, that it's best that you are covered by the blood of Jesus and that your sins have been forgiven and that God has forgiven you and placed you in his kingdom and that you are under the canopy, under the umbrella of grace. I'm going to tell you what, we don't talk about judgment much, but there is a day. Man, why do we go so hard at communicating good news to a lost and dying world? Why do we push so hard sharing Christ? Why do we push so hard, invite your family? Why do we push so hard, communicating good news? Why do we push this so hard? Is it that we just love abuse? No, it's not. It's because we know that there is a day that is forthcoming with every man, boy, with, will have to give an account of themselves and the actions that they have done. See, we think that it's all in this world and that when we die, it's just darkness. But I want you to know that that is a lie from the pit of hell. Yeah. That if you die outside of the blood of Jesus, yeah. that there is judgment that awaits. I mean, I'm not playing games. Jesus is not playing games. He's landing right in front of us right in front of us. And you would think that with these clear words that the Pharisees would fall at the feet of Jesus and ask for grace and mercy. Guess what they continue to do? Plot to kill you would think that when we go out and we present good news in a way of escape, that folks will come running, flocking. They don't. But there is a day where we will have to give an account. And if you're covered by Jesus, man, God bless you. Praise God. 
But man, I want your heart to break about those who will have to stand before the judgment throne of God. And will have to give an account for every word that they have spoken of evil they have done. And God, this righteous, holy God, will judge them for those words. I know. Ain't a way you want to end the message, is it? But Pastor Anderson gave me the verse number 37. And that's what verse number 37 is. <laughs> but I, I do want to clue us in that we need to take note because some of us are attracted to the world's kingdom. We look in and it looks good. It looks good. And we've not been discerning about the fruit of bad trees. But I want you to know that as you look at the kingdom of this world and all that it offers, it is a kingdom full of sorrow and distraction. It is ruled by fallen gods and their chief purpose is to spread pain in the name of godlessness. By your words you will be acquitted and by your words you will be condemned. In conclusion, I want, to, I want you to remember three, three things about the kingdom of God from this passage. That God's kingdom is a united force that cannot be stopped. It is unparalleled in power. An unstoppable force that cannot be thwarted. If you are opposing Jesus, you are kicking against a rock. Jesus Christ is the strong man that has shown up in our world who takes over the opposing kingdom through the cross and the resurrection. He loves going into places in our life and in our world where we believe there is no chance and winning. He keeps winning. Whatever it is, he wins. And I want you to know that the devil is defeated and his kingdom has been defeated and is falling apart in front of your eyes. No matter what you might think, his kingdom is done. We need to remind each other. We need to remind those around us of that fact. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessing on all those who have heard this word. God, I pray that this word will sink deep into our hearts and our minds. Challenge us. Lord God, we want to be ambassadors of this kingdom. Father, I pray, Lord, that, that there would be many this day who would seek out your kingdom throughout the earth and would be saved as a result of being welcomed into the kingdom of God. Lord, I thank you and I ask, Lord, your blessing on your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Kenny, for that powerful word this morning. Amen. <laughs> Powerful and challenging word. That's what the word of God should do. It should challenge us. Amen. Um, and that's what it did this morning. Challenged us this morning. Pastor Candy talked about road wins. He said, Jesus, go on the road and win. Amen. Amen. Um, and so, you know, the thing that, that struck me um, about, about what he said and about what the word of God said. It said, by your words you will be condemned, and by your words you will be acquitted. Think about that. Think about all the stuff that you have said to people, right? I got to lay down my religion for a minute, right? You can cuss them out. You know, do all kinds of stuff. Say all kinds of things, evil things, right? But God forgives for that. God forgives for that. You know, but what we can't do and Pastor Candy laid it out, um, is give Satan the credit for what God does. Amen. We cannot do that. And so by our words, we'll be condemned, but by our words, we'll be acquitted. There is forgiveness. There is forgiveness in Jesus Christ. There is forgiveness in, in our belief and our faith in him. There is forgiveness in, in accepting him as our personal Lord and Savior. There's some words, in other words, that we can say in order to be acquitted. I don't know if you've ever seen somebody acquitted. Black people jumped up and down when, when certain folk were acquitted. Right? But we can be acquitted right now. We can be forgiven. Uh, we can be set free. That Jesus actually sets us free. 
Um, and there are some words that we can say in order to be set free. Amen, amen. and amen. And so with every head bowed and with every eye closed, I want to invite you to come to know this Jesus that can acquit you this morning, that can forgive you for your sins, that can be the ultimate judge that can set you free from the darkness that, that, that we are in, that we have been in. Oh, we've all been in the muck and the mire, but Jesus, but God, plucks us out plucks us out, sets our feet on solid ground. You can be forgiven. You can be acquitted this morning. There are some words that you can say if you want to be forgiven this morning. If you want to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. If you want him to forgive you and to pardon you in your sins. Then just repeat this prayer after me. Dear Lord, I am a sinner and deserve the punishment for my sin. Dear Lord, I believe that Jesus paid the penalty for my sin. I ask for God's forgiveness. I will follow Jesus and I confess him as my Lord and Savior. I receive the free gift of salvation in Jesus Christ today. Amen. If you said this prayer with us this morning, then welcome to the family of Jesus Christ. Amen. Welcome to the family that, that'll, that'll hold you, that'll love you, that'll walk with you, that'll disciple you, that will guide you, that'll cry with you, that'll laugh with you, that will rejoice with you. Welcome to the family of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I need prayer this morning. I need prayer this morning. That word was... Just a fantastic word. And sometimes you're right, Pastor. You ain't got to preach it. It'll preach itself. <laughs> now, that was a clear word. You know, and so let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for, for giving us, Lord, your, your guidance, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for forgiveness of sins. We thank you for cleansing from unrighteousness. We thank you, Lord, that we can read your word, Lord, and, and, and hear your voice, Lord. We pray, Father, that we would carry out your word in all that we do. We pray that we would walk with you, Lord. We pray that we would listen to you, Lord, that not only would we be hearers, Lord, but doers of your word. We pray, Lord, for forgiveness of sins this morning. We pray, Father, that you would help us to... Say words that are edifying, Lord, and not words that tear down. We pray, Father, that our words would be acquitting and not condemning. We pray, Father, that uh, our words would be words that, that, would, that would give you the glory in everything that we do, Father. We pray, Lord, that you would bless and keep us, Lord. We pray that you would bless every household that is represented here, Lord. We pray, Father, that as we heard your word this morning and, and it cut, Lord, that that, that, we would, that you would bring healing, Lord. That you would bring healing, that you would bring mercy, that you would bring grace. We pray, Father, that you would just continue to bless and keep us, Lord. And that we would carry your word in our heart, Lord, as we move through this week, Lord. And move through our days and interact with other people, Lord, that we would be a blessing, Lord, to others. We pray all of these things, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus.